right, so the recording has started and Lisa, I will let you take it away. Great, thank you so much, Lynn. Hi everybody, my name is Lisa Seiko and I'm a plant ecologist with Seattle Parks and Recreation. And I will be your host today for our Green Seattle Partnership Workshop. Before we get started, I wanted to see if I can get the slides to advance, cover some Zoom basics, basically. I know that everybody is really pretty dialed on our virtual lifestyle right now, but I just wanted to remind everybody that all attendees are muted and have their videos off. We've got a lot of participants today, which is um, excellent. Um, but just for, uh, even though we'd love to see your faces, I think we also wanna make sure there's limited background noise. Um, as Lynn mentioned earlier, we'll be recording this presentation and it'll be available um, probably about in the next week. And so we'll make sure that we get those emailed out to everybody. Uh, if you have questions today, there's two options. Um, you should use the chat if you have questions for the host about problems like audio problems. Um, questions for the presenters should be um, included in the Q&A box at the, at the bottom of your screen. Today, we are uh, kind of want to lay the land what we're going to cover. Um, I'm actually going to start with a little background on the Green Seattle Partnership. Um, this workshop was originally conceived as kind of a continuing education workshop for program participants. Um, but because uh, it was going to be so excellent, we wanted to make sure that we could share it publicly. Um, so I wanted to make sure that uh, provide a little background for folks who aren't familiar with the program and also kind of make sure that we can continue coming back to implications for uh, Seattle uh, forest restoration. After that, uh, Dr. Shell will give his presentation and then he'll be joined by two of my colleagues from Seattle Parks and Recreation for a panel discussion. So to start, I wanted to recognize that we come to this conversation today on stolen land of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Duwamish, the Suquamish, the Muckleshoot, and the Stillaguamish, past and present. This land acknowledgement anchors us in a long story of this landscape, right? There's a deep legacy of racism and trauma in our urban ecosystems. From this picture, we also kind of get to anchor ourselves in the city. Uh, we've got downtown in the upper right-hand corner, uh, the Duwamish Valley in the foreground, as well as Puget Sound in the background, and you've got the West Duwamish Greenbelt dominating, um, dominating the left side of the screen. It gives you a sense of the land use, the, the cover that trees provide, um, and kind of the topography of Seattle. Uh, Seattle Parks and Recreation manages roughly 11% of the city's land base. And of that, 40% is part of the Green Seattle Partnership's work to restore forested parklands. Back down on the ground, uh, these forests are really forests uh, with people, right? Um, this has been the case for a time immemorial. This particular photo shows participants with a job training program called Dirt Corps, um, and here they're doing some forest assessment work. Uh, and the Green Seattle Partnership really focuses on how you bring people into these forests and, and how to build a long-term commitment to stewardship of these lands. The program has been active for 15 years and we've had a lot of success in that time. Um, we've uh, surpassed uh, the million mark in a couple different ways. Uh, we've planted over a million native plants uh, in Seattle's forests and then we've also um, logged over a million volunteer hours. Uh, so really bringing that connection to the land and investment to our shared forests. With this work, our intention is to not only do like really foundational invasive plant management and tree planting, um, but it's an effort to really restore these spaces and unlock these spaces, which offers the opportunity to improve human health and well-being through access to nature, um, the opportunity to build back wildlife habitat, um, improve the broader health of Puget Sound, strengthen neighborhood cohesion um, through volunteer programming and other community engagement efforts, um, as well as to do some real on the ground uh, climate change adaptation and resiliency work. So this is Seward Park, um, much like the first slide. Uh, this is my favorite park in the park system, hands down. Uh, and I took this photo a couple weeks ago on a walk with my best friend, you know, masked up, uh, talking about all of our um, pandemic 
uh, drama and troubles. Um, and, you know, being in this space that um, really offers a lot of healing power, right? Um, so I think I wanted to center here today that to take care of these forests is really to take care of our community. And um, it's, a, it's a forest that our community depends on. Uh, and that has been more true than ever this year. What is also true this year in this year of all years, right, is that the Green Seattle Partnership has a program um, made up of city departments and partner organizations and individuals has some serious blind spots in our understanding of how management of this forest is linked to systemic racism and environmental injustice. Um, as an example, um, we do work in Seattle screen spaces um, really framed by a white led environmental movement. Um, the civil rights reckoning of 2020 really has offered a chance to dig into some of the root ideas um, like conservation. Turns out John Muir here, um, pictured here is the founder of the Sierra Club um, and kind of patron saint of the national park system. Um, was incredibly racist. And so those kind of core values and goals um, that come from that history um, still continue to center white ways of knowing. I think these images are pretty recognizable to folks, um, but for those of you unfamiliar with Barbecue Becky on the left and Amy Cooper on the right, um, both of these women use their white privilege fueled by racism to enforce their way uh, um, in a public park space. And so um, building advocates for forests and parks is really foundational to the Green Seattle Partnership. Um, and so we have to be especially careful and thoughtful about how we build leadership roles and how we build community voice. And I will be honest here, I think that the GSP program and the broader park system is still very much plagued by toxic white privilege. But what blows it all out of the water for me is some of the research that Dr. Shell has done um, and kind of why we are all here today. Um, what can a coyote caught in a camera trap tell us about racism in our urban ecosystems? Um, so to help us understand that, I would like to introduce Dr. Shell. Um, he is an urban ecologist interested in socio-ecological evolutionary dynamics in cities. How, how they contribute to patterns of human carnivore conflict. Um, his research focuses on how organism by environment interactions in cities shape the behavior, physiology, and genomics of urban wildlife, partic particularly mammalian carnivores. In addition, his work integrates principles from natural sciences with urban studies and critical race theory to address how racial and economic oppression affect urban ecosystems. In doing so, his lab spotlights the need to promote justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in conservation environmentalist movements, as well as amplify environmental equity and civil rights in addressing the climate crisis. Uh, Chris received his BA in psychology from Columbia University and master's and PhD in evolutionary biology from the University of Chicago. Since joining the faculty in School of Interdisciplinary interdisciplinary arts and sciences at the University of Washington, Tacoma. Chris has launched the Grit City Carnivore Project, a research collaborative um, with the Point Defiance Zoo and Aquarium and Metro Parks Tacoma to uncover the patterns and process by which wildlife are adapting to cities. Together with this, uh, his collaborators, Chris works to connect local and national communities with wildlife while si simultaneously working to uncover the mechanisms that drive urban adaptation in wildlife. So thank you, Chris, for being here. Absolutely. Thank you, Lisa, for the uh, awesome introduction and appreciate y'all for having me today chat with you about some of the research we've been doing and then also the kind of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary links between when you see a tree, when you see a coyote, what, what does that mean to the landscape? What does that mean for us kind of as biologists and ecologists, but what does that mean for us as a society? So y'all will get to know that I, I very much like to, when I'm, when I'm doing any of my lectures or seminars, uh, share stories about the animals. Because I feel like the stories that help us it really connect to them, help us to think about ourselves in ways that we wouldn't have otherwise done. Um, so science communication has really taught me that the, the best way to impart some of these harder concepts is through 
the avatars that we see across the landscape. And today's gonna be no different. So I'm gonna share the story for y'all that got me interested into urban coyotes in the first place and urban carnivores generally, and what that means for us as we make our way through this journey. So I'll just say these photos are not Photoshop. They're actual photos of a coyote in a drink cooler in a Quiznos in downtown Chicago in 2008. And for those of you that have been to or know of Chicago, you know that downtown and State Street is pretty urbanized. That's, that is the Chicago that most people think of. So imagine a coyote walking through that. That's exactly what happened. This animal, this individual here decided to walk into said Quiznos while people were eating their sandwiches and preparing sandwiches at the back. They all stop what they're doing as the animal walks in nonchalantly like he owns the joint. Then proceeds to walk into the cooler and hangs out in the cooler and then falls asleep in said cooler and stays asleep for a good 45 minutes until animal control comes to relocate the animal. This has sparked my research in ways that really gets to this fundamental question. Why did this individual animal decide to go into the Quiznos when others didn't? What is it about this individual coyote that said, hey, you know, I'm just going to go chill in this cooler and it's going to be okay. Fast forward to about a couple months ago. All right, so this photo is a recent one of two raccoons that somehow magically broke into a chase bank in Redwood City, California, looking for food. And eventually had to be chased out of said chase bank, which is just ironic on every double entendre level. But I like to think that the dialogue between these two animals was that this one was saying, dude, we gotta go, we got a camera, we gotta go. And the other one is like, I'm not leaving until I get what's mine. So again, this keeps popping up, right? I, I highlighted two examples of wildlife finding ways to get into areas that we thought were previously not possible. But these are two of many, many, many different examples where these animals are showing these individual behaviors that then span out to the population and give us a really good insight into how the city is shaping the way in which these animals are both surviving and thriving. So keep that in your back pocket as we then go big and then go small and go big again. Here, I'm going to start you all off with the premise. Lisa kind of already embedded this seed a little bit here, but we're going to start with the premise being that social inequality is an ecological issue. And by understanding it as such, then we can start to peel away how injustices on the landscape that influence society, human societies, also influence the way in which the natural landscape is shaped as well. This is incredibly important because this determines where we put all of our stewardship, but also where we see some of the sinks and the sources that are relevant to the organisms that live in our cities. And there's no better way to do that than to start with Sir Jeff Goldblum here, who at the, of, of course, I'm sure y'all know this by now, and if you don't, go ahead and start in a notebook, a reading list or a watch list for you to have during the holidays, because you gotta watch the original Jurassic Park. In this movie, Ian Malcolm, who's played by Jeff Goldblum, who's a chaos theorist, talks about how life is finding a way. And that's really into illusion of dinosaurs finding their way outside of the confines that human beings created for, you know, classic thriller movie with dinosaurs. You can never really truly contain them. I like to think that my figurative dinosaurs are coyotes in this sense, where I say life is in fact finding a way dot 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 in cities and not just coyotes not just u.s cities this is cities all across the globe across every longitude and latitude you can think of from singapore and urban smooth coated otters finding their way in urbanized areas to yes even raccoons in the seattle tacoma region and everything in between these organisms are finding ways to adapt to what was previously considered inhospitable environments so much so that the drivers that oftentimes are characteristic to human cities are shaping that same individual variation we were just talking about, right? So from the top, from the top of this talk, we had talked about why did Coyote A decide to go in versus Coyote B? Well, imagine what these animals are experiencing. Everything from differences in noise regimes, food subsidies, light regimes, all the way to building densities and socioeconomic status. All of that is combining to influence the way in which these animals' gene expression, their physiology, 
and their behavior are all responding to make sure they stay alive in the city, which then also ultimately influences their fitness, whether or not they survive or not, and then therefore influences population variation. So over time, what we've seen repeatedly over and over and over again is that if you go to any city, you'll see populations of urban adapted species that really are quite tolerant of people. Think of pigeons, for instance, right? There's almost no city you can go to now that doesn't have some species of pigeon or another type of bird species. Think also those house sparrows or small passerines that you see that are brown and black and hop everywhere, right? They have cracked the code of being in cities. Important to note, at the center of this equation, as Lisa had alluded to, are people, right? So human beings are the directors and the audience of this screenplay. Consider ourselves the Lin-Manuel Mirandas of this joint. We not only cast the cast, we composed the music, we drew the curtains, we even put together the fancy rotating stage, but we also are acting in the play. We also are sitting back watching it as it unfolds. As I like to show here with this buck who is chasing a woman who likely was antagonizing said buck, but you can imagine that there were several steps in between that where said individual had to get used to being around people. Maybe that individual is being fed because people love to see it. And then it got to be an adult and all of a sudden it's like, no, this is my territory. There were no other negative experiences. I own this. Um, so you can imagine, right? We created the stage by which this, this picture happened. To that point, me and several co-authors here led by Simone de Roche in Evolutionary Applications recently published this conceptual piece thinking about how society influences ecology, which influences evolution, which goes back to society. So things like politics and the economy, human health and demographics, transportation infrastructure, all of these features that we oftentimes siphon or silo away from natural systems, they are inextricably linked to the things that we oftentimes think about, habitat modification and fragmentation, preference and selection by specific organisms, connectivity across the landscape, you can imagine, right, if we're thinking about I-5, the green spaces on the west or the east side, that highway, and the decisions to where that highway is going to be and how different neighborhoods conserve their green space influences the way in which certain organisms will or will not cross that highway barrier, which will then influence how those animals interact with each other, which then influences gene flow and genetic drift. Therefore, you start to see how the, the, the way in which we build the landscape shapes the way in which these animals adapt. Good example that was taken from this paper that we put together just a few months ago were mosquitoes. Now, I'm sure almost everybody on this call has some experience of mosquitoes, right? Whether they're good, which it's hard to imagine some of the good ones, but okay, good and bad, right? So let's think about the urban landscape and habitat conditions necessary for mosquitoes to breed. What we know is that really these mosquitoes just need standing water, potentially away from predators, in order to be able to breed successfully and have a good reproductive success. So what we've seen in recent papers, one in particular that was published by Katz et al. in 2019, takes a look at the distribution of impervious surface covers, so think concrete, right, in buildings, in relation to standing water, as well as income gradients. And what they find is that there's this really tight relationship between impervious surfaces and income, meaning, that there are more impervious surfaces, more concrete and the like, in low-income neighborhoods in Baltimore. That's important because the amount of standing water pools tends to increase in those areas and in those areas with greater impervious surfaces, there's reduced biotic interactions, meaning all the predators that normally eat the mosquitoes, they're gone. So imagine if you're a mosquito, you have a bunch of standing bodies of water and nothing to eat you. What they ended up finding was that those mosquitoes in those low income neighborhoods with greater impervious surfaces have greater reproductive success, they grow faster, their body size is bigger. Why is that all important? Well, because all of those life history traits influence their ability to pass on disease. These zoonotic diseases that go from one species to the next. So you can imagine that those that live in low income neighborhoods have a greater vulnerability to zoonotic diseases that are passed by mosquitoes. Imagine what that does to the way in which we manage mosquito populations. Of course, you'll think that, all right, well, management will go out and do a broad scale application of pesticides. 
normally that's not always the case because of resources. So you start to see how there is this patchy network of where pesticides are applied. And Ecology 101, if you don't apply them equally across the landscape, you start to see pesticide resistance. So that pesticide resistance feeds back into the way in which mosquitoes are able to transmit diseases, which again, places the burden on low income communities and oftentimes communities of color. So this example here is one of many, we could also talk about rodents, we could talk about geese, we could talk about seagulls, we could talk about sea lions, we could talk about many other organisms, Himalayan blackberry or English ivy that all have these different types of feedback mechanisms that influence the way in which we respond to the organisms and how they adapt to us. And yeah, this has a price tag. You can imagine that the price tag, whether it be for human health or otherwise, is felt more by certain communities than it is from others. Which brings me to the significance of structure. We're gonna kind of pare things down a little bit here and I'm providing you a photo of UW Seattle's campus and this cherry blossom tree, right? And I'm doing so for a reason because I want y'all to now think of and embody yourselves as this next avatar. That avatar being the Lorax. I'm sure most of y'all on this call have heard of Dr. Seuss's the Lorax. If not, go ahead and read the book or do yourself a favor and watch the 2013 Dr. Seuss's Lorax, who was aptly played by Danny DeVito. So you can now, you're, you're not gonna unsee Danny DeVito as the Lorax, but y'all are gonna be the Lorax now. We're gonna follow the trees, right? So I want you in this next photo, I'm gonna show you that's in Tacoma, just maybe about, there are two photos about a half mile away from each other. And I'm gonna have you think about, okay, where are the trees? Where's the vegetation? Where's the green space cover? Now, a little bit of background on these two photos. Photo on the left is one of University Place, right? Township right up against Tacoma. Photo on the right is Southeast Tacoma. Many of you have probably driven through these neighborhoods so you know what they look like. And you also probably know where I'm going with this. If I were to ask you, which of these neighborhoods has greater vegetation cover or tree canopy cover? That one's easy, right? Probably say the one on the left. Even if you're colorblind, you probably can see that the, the way in which the landscape is shaped is fundamentally different in the photo on the left versus the one on the right. Then if I were to follow up that question, and if you have grown up in a city at all, right? Y'all live in Seattle. So if you even have experiences of just living in Seattle for the last few years, you'll get this, this question as well. If I were to ask you, which of these neighborhoods do you think has a higher median household income or a higher per capita income? You probably wouldn't flinch. You likely would say the photo on the left. If you know that inherently and you're thinking it, guess what? That idea has a name to it. It's called the luxury effect. This idea that species richness and biodiversity are positively associated with wealth. Species richness here being the number of species, biodiversity being the relative proportion of those species compared to the other species in the community. This not only has impacts on say tree species diversity, but wealth structures communities worldwide across many different ecological trophic levels, if you will. Now we're gonna get into a little bit of why wealth alone doesn't explain everything. And that's gonna be an important piece of this narrative. But before I even get into that, I think it's important to highlight that there are tons of studies. And if this is the first time you heard of the luxury effect, I've done you a solid. Here's a literature review of all of the studies that have taken a look at the luxury effect. And even now, this is outdated, right? There are a couple of papers that recently were published that have looked at each of these different trophic levels to find that tree species diverse, all occupancy, whether or not a mammal occupies a site within an urban region are all influenced by how wealthy that region is. So for us here in the Pacific Northwest, we have been empirically addressing that question as well to understand whether or not our mammals in the Tacoma Seattle region are also being influenced by these wealth gradients. And we've been doing that through the Grit City Carnivore Project, which is a collaboration between UW Tacoma, Point Defiant Zoo and Aquarium, and Metro Parks Tacoma, as well as with the Urban Wildlife Information Network. And I should also give a shout out and we'll show some data from the Seattle Urban Carnivore Project, which is headed up by Woodland Park Zoo and Seattle University's Robert 
Long, and Mark Jordan. So a brief preamble, UN is this partnership of researchers using wildlife monitoring to understand the ecology and behavior of urban species. So we're all using these camera trap arrays on these urban to rural gradients for about 29 cities and counting. Most of the cities are in the contiguous 48 states. However, we do have a city in Canada and hopefully we'll have some cities in Mexico as well, as well as several countries in Africa in the next five years or so. This allows us to answer some fundamental questions about the behavior and the ecology of species, specifically mammals that live in our cities. However, I should note that we're also unveiling and rolling out different pilot studies that look at auditory monitoring of the animals, doing small mammal trapping, and so on and so forth. To give you a bird's eye view of what this looks like for us here in Tacoma, we've been monitoring urban mammals since fall of 2018. This map here at the top left shows you in yellow all of the sites that we've had cameras at before, and there are several others that are outside of this map. Um, and we will set up our cameras in these block designs in order to capture the seasonality of how these animals move across the landscape. So for instance, we just wrapped our fall field season, which was in October. Our winter field season is coming up here in January. Our spring field season is going to be in April, and then summer field season in July. And at any given point in time, we have about 29 to 36 cameras out in the field. The variance in the number of cameras really comes down to when we're working in urban systems, we're not just working around the non-human organisms, but we're also working around the human organisms. So we will have to mitigate, say, instances of theft and have messy data, but that is ecology 101, right? We get these awesome photos that, you know, traditional wildlife ecologists will oftentimes use and show and it's, it's hard to not show awesome photos of animals because it really excites folks about like, oh, wow, I didn't realize that there was a black-tailed deer, you know, in my backyard. Or, oh, I, I heard the coyotes, but I had never seen them. Um, one of my favorite photos is the one here in the top right, which is about maybe three or four blocks away from UW Tacoma's campus of raccoons practicing their parkour. You see a couple hanging here and here. And of course, right, our cameras are not only great for still images, but for video. So this video may be a little bit stilty for y'all, but it gets the point across, right? We get to we get to see babies in the field. Like who, who doesn't like that? So here's a baby bobcat, which notice the, the date on here, the timestamp. This is March 9th, 2020. So one of the ongoing projects we're currently involved in is seeing how changes in human activity as a function of stay-at-home orders are also changing activity patterns of wildlife across the city. Now, in this next slide, I'm going to show you some preliminary data from the UN network using the camera data that we've gotten, so these photo images you've seen, transcribing them into the number of species that we encounter across our different sites and taking a look at whether or not they are related to proxies of wealth. So on the top here is data from Seattle. On the bottom is data from Tacoma. Both of the x-axes show income scaled by a cost of a one-bedroom apartment. And the y-axis is species richness, so the number of species that are found at a site. Now, not to go into too much detail about the way in which we did the stats, but briefly, this is taken from a Bayesian occupancy model. And after performing said model from the posterior distribution, we're able to extract the variance in terms of species richness for each of the sites, which is represented by each black dot. So each black dot has one camera trap site. And these black lines are the confidence intervals of those camera trap sites. So what you see are these positive relationships between species richness and income scale by a cost of one bedroom for both Seattle and Tacoma. Even as green as these areas are, we'll, we're still seeing these wealth disparities influence where the organisms are. I've been talking a lot about the biotic or the living factors that are influenced by wealth, but it should be noted that all the abiotic factors, the non-living things, are also influenced by these wealth disparities. In this section, I affectionately call the avatar last airbender section. Again, list a list of things to you guys to, to watch if you haven't already done so, um, where we talked a little bit about earth, but two, there are effects of Abi you know, abiotic effects of, of water and air and fire as well. So let's start, let's start with fire, figuratively speaking. Hopefully the city of Seattle is not on fire right now. <laughs> so the urban heat island effect is essentially this idea that 
says that cities tend to be anywhere from three to 10 degrees hotter than rural or non-urban environments. That's predominantly because of these concrete surfaces, these impervious surfaces we just talked about, relative to the proportion of green space because green space provides this environmental cooling for us, right? And that happens through mechanisms like heat absorption and retention, plant transpiration and water evaporation from the soil and water penetration. Now, if we were to take a map looking at surface temperatures by census block across the city and then compare that to income gradients, we get maps that look a little bit like this. So if you're curious about not just Seattle, but other cities, this resource right here from NPR takes a look at that exact question and hypothesis I just posed to y'all. What would, what would the city look like if we overlaid surface temperatures with income gradients? And sure enough, what you see is that the hottest regions tend to be those that have the lowest income. That's again, due to say the reduction in environmental cooling. This is paired um, quite closely with where air pollution hazards are across the city and how they spatially and temporally are distributed. So a recent study done by Christopher Tessam et al, 2019 in Nature Sustainability, did something really artful. They created this pollution inequity index, which you see over here, the figure to the left. And the pollution inequity index essentially just states that if you are below this zero line threshold, you are generating more air pollution through the consumption of goods and services, then you are being burdened by air pollution. Whereas if your values are above this zero line threshold, you are being burdened more by air pollution than you are generating it. Here they looked at 15 years of data across multiple cities and these colored lines, the blue line here at the bottom is for white Americans, this orange line right here is for Latinx Americans. This green line is for African Americans. So over a 15 year period, and I bet if we were to tack on 2015 to 2020, we probably wouldn't see any relenting in these patterns. Year after year after year, we're seeing that black and brown communities have a greater air pollution inequity relative to their white counterparts. Again, this is in multiple cities and artfully they controlled for income. So even after you control for income gradients, you see that there are racial and ethnic disparities that exist in terms of who is experiencing the air pollution. That's particularly relevant today as we think about how we're doing this Zoom session all feasibly in our bedrooms, our guest rooms, our workout rooms, in our closets, kitchens, right? Because of COVID. Well, more research has come out to show that air pollution hazard is linked to whether or not you contract and die from COVID. And one of a recent set of studies done by one of my good colleagues, Kimberly Terrell, takes a look at air pollution hazard and COVID-19 death rates along this stretch, stretch of the Mississippi called Cancer Alley. If you're curious why it's called Cancer Alley, it's predominantly because many toxic waste sites and industrial pollutants are co-located along this stretch of the Mississippi. It's also called Cancer Alley because unfortunately, the majority of folks that are around the stretch of the Mississippi um, have a ton of ailments, including many different types of cancers linked to say these environmental inequities. The majority of these communities in these census blocks are communities of color and not by accident. After emancipation and during Southern reconstruction, many black communities were relegated to these areas where EPA regulations were completely relaxed. And at that time that increased the amount of air pollution hazard in that region. Hence, when we start to look at data for say COVID-19 and why the death rates are so high for black, brown and indigenous communities, this is one of many examples where government sponsored regulation influenced environmental inequity and racism that led to the actual reduction in livelihoods for people that live in those regions. This is also tied to climate change as we all kind of are very much aware of and have personal experience with, fires along the West Coast have gotten quite bad in the last few years and likely will continue to do so. So here I provide a photo for you. This one on the left is of the San Francisco Bay region a couple months ago. Photo on the right for you movie buffs out there. You'll automatically say like, oh snap, is that Blade Runner in 2049? Yeah, it is. 
The one on the right looks better. I'd rather be with Ryan Gosling right now. Honestly, I mean, who wouldn't? But like, seriously, though, like I'd rather be with Ryan Gosling right now. So these are questions that are going to be very much top of mind as we're thinking about who is facing most of the air pollution inequity and what that means for us as stewards of the landscape. And then access to clean water also is being impacted by wealth and how it structures community, but also being impacted by structural and systemic racism. These photos really don't need much of a caption at all. They're taken from Flint, Michigan, which should be noted, the Flint, Michigan water crisis is still ongoing, which led to the disenfranchisement of many predominantly black communities and communities of color and low-income communities and their quality of water which has had detrimental, sublethal, and lethal effects on those individuals. So thinking about how we steward clean water is also part of this narrative, which at the beginning of this entire section, I had talked to you all about how there's this positive relationship oftentimes between wealth and biodiversity, but it's not always the case. So one of the recent meta-analyses that was done by Curious et al. in 2020 takes a look at all the studies that were trying to assess the luxury effect. And they separate these studies between flora and fauna, as well as between land use consideration, so residential all the way to non-residential, the density of the city, and the type of relationship, whether it was positive, like we would expect, negative, so the opposite of what we'd expect, or neutral, meaning no relationship at all. And as you can see, right, it's not universal. In some instances in residential areas, yeah, flora and fauna, there, there does seem to be this positive relationship. But if you change land use consideration, uh, it gets a little bit more fuzzy. If you change the density of the city, it's, it's not so you know, cut and dry. And that's particularly because the way in which wealth structures communities isn't this linear gradient. And also wealth is just a proxy. We oftentimes talk about wealth and median household income, but there are many drivers that influence who has the wealth, who has the power, who has the privilege, which then means we need to dig a little bit deeper, right? Like we can't just focus on the luxury effect as scientists, as stewards of the landscape, as people of the landscape, and then say, okay, we're good. No, it, it actually takes us to a lot of hard work that we need to do to dig into structural racism and classism and how things like law enforcement and immigration policy and resource allocation influenced by systemic biases, all shape these different features that we just talked about. Just talked about impervious surfaces, urban heat islands, environmental pollutants, disease dynamics, right? All of these smash all together and shape the ecology and the evolution of the species that live in our environments. So for me, as somebody who is a conservationist, I'm oftentimes thinking about, well, if we wanna conserve certain species, just thinking about the species alone, isn't going to cut it. Like we have to start talking about these different landscape dynamics and how they're influenced by us. And it should be noted, right? We're talking a lot about cities and we're talking a lot about Seattle and what Seattle can do. But what we do in the city isn't restricted to the city. Ecosystem Ecology 101, what we do here, those nutrients will oftentimes cycle outside of cities and back into cities. So if you can imagine, right, consider the way in which you treat your community, how we treat each other, how systemic racism and classism influence the way in which our communities operate, that's going to also harm polar bears and the Brazilian rainforest and different organisms that we oftentimes think of as bellwethers to talk about how important conservation is. We can't have this conversation if we don't talk about equity and justice which leads us to one of the important fundamental tenets of this entire ordeal, that many of the structural problems that you see are government sponsored. And I provide for you one of those examples that has gotten a lot of attention this year in particular, redlining. This policy from the 1930s to 1968 that was sponsored by the US government, specifically the Homeowners Loan Corporation, or HOLC, that systematically denied various services to residents of specific, often racially associated individuals, neighborhoods, or communities that either directly or indirectly influenced their ability to be in neighborhoods that were wealthier or predominantly white. 
So you'll see here this map of Oakland. This map is color coded from green to red, where green and blue are these A and B regions. And they were predominantly wealthy, predominantly white neighborhoods. Whereas the yellow and red were C and D graded regions, oftentimes deemed as hazardous. These areas that white folks almost never went to, but many communities of color were relegated to. There are many stories from my ancestors of being able to have the economic mobility to buy in these regions, but housing agents refusing to show them homes or hiding in their cars and watching as black residents walk through the neighborhood. Many of these A and B greater regions were also sundown towns. If you don't know that term, sundown town essentially is a town that if you were black and found in that neighborhood after sundown, you were immediately lynched on site. This was, again, sponsored by our US government, chopped and screwed in every sort of way in almost every city you can think of. If you're curious to learn more about the history of redlining, I urge you to look at this book, The Color of Law, written by Richard Rothstein. You could also take a look at this resource here put together by the University of Richmond on the Mapping Inequality Project. All of these maps are different redlining maps for many cities. And this is just a segment, right? You see, I start here with 61. There are many maps before that and many after that. There's a huge legacy of residential segregation based on systemic racism and oppression that's influenced where the green space is, where the habitat is, where the animals are gonna be. So here I just highlight for you Tacoma and Seattle. You can imagine if you, again, are a steward of the landscape and you want to conserve species, imagine if you're doing a bunch of work here in these parks that were previously green or blue for only white communities. Well, yeah, you're doing great there, but what about these regions when animals try to move? Because guess what? Animals are gonna move. Imagine how this influences habitat fragmentation. Imagine how this influences which animals die more frequently and which ones are able to survive. Imagine where the genetic bottlenecks may be that influences your success in conserving a species. And then imagine how people generated these maps. I'm not pulling these questions out of nowhere, right? There's some preliminary evidence from some preprints that already show how tree canopy cover is influenced by this policy. So Dexter Locke and colleagues took a look at these A through D graded regions across 37 US cities and almost every single city, A and then sometimes B regions, right? So green and blue tend to have greater tree canopy cover relative to those C and D graded regions. This still holds true and the policy was abolished more than 50 years, y'all. More than 50 years and this still holds true. So baked onto the landscape is residential segregation and racism influencing the way in which these animals are thriving and surviving, influencing the way in which individual organisms, back to the beginning of the talk, are shaping the way in which they respond to us. Remember, we're the directors, right? This is that rotating stage we just created so we can rectify it. So beginning of this talk, I set you out with the premise, right? Social inequality is an ecological issue. By that same tenet then, environmental justice and anti-racism that acutely looks at environmental racism and what it has done to our peoples is also important to understand what it has done to our natural landscapes. It in fact is the tool that we have for urban conservation and sustainability, which helps us to deconstruct, perform reconciliation and mobilize our communities in ways that allow all folks to participate, and especially those that have been marginalized in many of these co communities and conversations. And it should be noted, these conversations have been had for quite some time, right? Civil rights era has produced much of what we talked about. This is not me stating anything new. The, this has been hashed and rehashed over and over and over again. And now, as we have the ability to envision what our future is going to look like post pandemic, we need to reach back into our roots to understand how civil rights era laws and policies and mandates can help us build a better future that centers justice at all of this to better be conservation and stewards of the land. And as noted, right, we are in our we are in our own civil rights era. Hopefully, the change that we generate now will be longstanding for us as we are facing multiple pandemics, not just climate change, not just COVID, but also the pandemic of racism. 
And that means changing the way in which we consider conservation, how we consider a conservation action and a conservation success, rather than just think about reproduction and how abundant an organism is and whether or not they have enough genetic connectivity, subverting the question and thinking about building equitable capital and fighting poverty as a means of creating better strategies for long-term conservation success. So for instance, take affordable housing, right? Very topical for us right now, as we're trying to think about ways to increase equity amongst our homeless population and our constituents. By creating greater affordable housing that's long-term, say for instance, rent control forever, or creating pathways to home ownership, that we can create ecological stability in the neighborhood. We just talked about how human beings influence feedbacks into the eco-evil processes that influence the society. So if you maintain stability and reduce gentrification and displacement, that stability also allows for more, say for instance, native species to colonize our urban environments. Increasing accessible healthcare. So the health of a population, human population, can influence the health of wildlife populations as well. And that is no more apparent than, again, COVID, which was originated as a zoonotic disease from human wildlife interactions. Influencing our health and making sure that our health is stabilized also makes sure the health of non-human organisms is stabilized as well. This goes all the way down to strengthening voting rights and amplifying the voices of those that have been unheard for too long. You know, and the positive of all of it is that even in all of this doom and gloom um, in, in the, the final battle against Thanos, like we have the ability to, to make it happen. We really do. It, it just takes a little bit of effort to think outside of ourselves, to think compassionately, to center folks of color and especially women of color in these narratives, and to center indigenous traditional ecological knowledge as well as community knowledge, right? We all have a role and a part to play in this narrative. And if we all get a chance to play that role, then we can come out of this story with a Hamilton. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you for, for joining us for the call today. Many of my UW collaborators, as well as Point Defiant Zoo and Aquarium, all of my UN collaborators, and there are many more than just what's on this list here. Um, all of the folks on the Socio Eco Evo Network, School of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences at UW Tacoma and our community partners. And with that, I will open up for any questions y'all may have. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, I don't know about everybody else, but I've got like Jill's. It was amazing. And I think the, the chat and the Q&A are kind of blowing up. So um, I do want to start uh, off by introducing our other panelists today. Uh, we have um, Michael Yadrick from Seattle Parks and Recreation. Um, and just to provide a little bio from Michael, uh, Michael is a um, certified ecological restoration practitioner at Seattle Parks and Recreation, uh, supporting the Green Seattle Partnership specifically. Um, he's also the co-founder of the Arbutus Army and creator of the Tree Hugger podcast. Michael is a returned Peace Corps volunteer from Bolivia and a former AmeriCorps volunteer. He has a dual MA in International Affairs from American University and Natural Resources and Sustainable Development from the University for Peace in Costa Rica. His bachelor's of science is from the Evergreen State College. Michael currently serves on the board of directors for the Northwest chapter of the Society for Ecological Restoration, as well as the Tacoma Tree Foundation. We also have Shanyanika McElroy. I always have that wrong. Um, and Shannon is also with Seattle Parks and Recreation. Uh, she's a policy and organizational performance analyst. Um, she works in the superintendent's office and has three main focuses in her work. She focuses on equity and inclusion, race and social justice initiative, um, the organizational performance management initiative and policy management. She's been with Seattle Parks and Recreation for 20 years and has held positions in recreation, food systems and experiential education. Shan represents King County on the Washington Recreation and Parks Association Board of Directors and chairs the association's statewide equity, inclusion and belonging committee. So thank you guys for joining our conversation today. Um, I'm actually gonna kick it off with a couple um, questions um, as I also start to see some, some questions piling up in the Q&A. As a reminder folks, if you use um, the Q&A, that's where we'll be looking for questions. The chat is just for um, more technical issues. So I wanted to start kind of come by coming back to um, the idea of displacement. 
I think um, this is something that is super strong in our story in Seattle right now. Um, and I think is there's a little bit of a, a question mark there, right? Where, you know, the Green Seattle Partnerships work is really focused on restoring forested parklands and building health and well being for people across the city. Um, but restoration can also be a signal of um, green gentrification. So I wanted to start by asking Chris kind of what your thoughts are and how 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 that works, how restoration of green spaces can can trigger green gentrification. Yeah, absolutely. And that that question is perhaps the most important and, and the lowest hanging fruit for policy because we'll oftentimes think, okay, well, in order to restore the space, let's let's plant more trees, right? That's the answer. That is a small part of the answer um, because there are other ways to be able to retain that same level of ecological function while at the same time centering communities. So for instance, right, we know given the data and repeated studies that when you plant trees, it has the propensity to increase property taxes, housing values, and everything else in terms of cost of living in that region, which then leads to displacing those peoples. So oftentimes, if we are scientists and we come into these communities and say, hey, do you know how good it is to plant trees in your yard? Folks will rightly so be like, uh, I don't wanna do that. I, I don't wanna lose my house. Here's the other thing, the kicker of the history of these regions is that many of the folks that live in those communities, unfortunately don't own those homes. So mm -hmm. they may be renting those homes, rent goes up by $500,000, maybe even more. And in ways that are completely unjust, but fly under the radar, right? So there may be laws that are broken by the amount of rent increase that happens, but folks normally turn a blind eye to that because there aren't any, there's not, not enforcement on the books to, to make that happen. So you start to continue to see as, yeah, we may be making progress in technology, we may be making progress in other sectors, but at the expense and on the backs of other peoples and specifically peoples of color and low income communities. So what that means is that those policies of, of creating the green space means you also need to have housing policies that, that make sure those folks get to stay where they are. Have policies that say like, all right, well, trees may not necessarily be the good thing to do the good situation because some folks, again, rightly so may say, I don't want trees because it brings certain wildlife that I can't or don't have the ability to deal with. So trees may bring certain pest species. They may bring certain organisms that then cause another additional type of burden in human wildlife conflict. One answer to that, to kind of reconcile as a compromise, build urban gardens. Those urban gardens can serve as these ecological stepping stones, if you will. So mm -hmm. say plant pollinator interactions can increase, also increases food sovereignty and ownership of the land. So it allows for folks to be able to go to this green space and feel pride in the green space. And also it has an ecological benefit. So there are other ways than not, you know, other ways other than just planting trees that really can be helpful, but it has to be paired with the policy, which means talking to policymakers and lawmakers to get laws on the books to say, when we plant these trees, we need to make sure that the people that are here stay here. And that cultural tapestry is important because it has trickle down effects in the way in which, again, we want to keep the community knowledge, that community knowledge of where people are and how they interact with wildlife it's going to be really important for keeping the wildlife that we see in our environment. Nice. Shan, do you have um, some additional um, input on kind of how Seattle Parks and Recreation is considering green gentrification? Sure. At this time, um, we are really engaged more in symbolic change, things like endure, um, ensuring the identity of community within which a park sits is reflected in the foundational design um, of all of our future uh, developments. With recognition that parks can be a critical feature in a neighborhood's public network, our planning and development team is moving away from generic homogenous park design um, and bringing about those type of ideals and looking to lift community voice by deepening our efforts to collaborate with community about what they would like to see in their community and making sure those spaces really reflect uh, who lives there currently. We're hoping that uh, this will result in park space that's welcoming, yes, but also supports the visibility of communities who are experiencing marginalization as a symbolic step. We have a lot of work to do in this area. We are more, like I said, in an awareness and a symbolic change phase um, and trying to deepen our practice. So I really encourage if folks are interested specifically um, in relationship and partnership with us in this area to reach uh, our planning and development division director, Andy Sheffer. 
and our property management um, manager, um, Max Jacobs, uh, to help us really deepen our practice here. We could, we could use that partnership. Yeah, awesome. Um, so uh, a question from, from the Q&A next. Um, wildlife habitat is fragile. Birds uh, will not nest if dogs and even people are present. What is the value of dedicating natural areas off limits to people uh, when there is so little open space to be had? Chris, do you want to kick that off? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, right? Because we know from at least our evidence here in Point Defiance Park that just because you have the green space doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have the animals that are you want to have thrive. So creating spaces that are separate from those human populations is important, but it's also important to realize, right, that like human beings and the way in which we use that landscape is fundamental as well. So creating spaces that maybe you can have human traffic, but no animal traffic may be one of the responses. Or for instance, we talked about Amy Cooper at the top of this, um, making sure that your dog is leashed can be mm -hmm. really important as well. Like there are little things here or there. I mean, we can't not talk about um, domestic pets with also without also talking about domestic cats. And if you have outdoor cats, keep your cat indoors, right? That one is a really simple low hanging fruit, but still seems to be really hard for folks because, and here's the kicker, right? Folks that often, and we've done a lot of community work asking people about how you perceive coyotes, whether or not you like or dislike them. And then we ask them, do you have a cat that's outdoors? And oftentimes we see this really tight correlation between folks that don't like coyotes and if you have an outdoor cat. Mm -hmm. And the reason for keeping that outdoor cat is that they see that their transference of ownership over the land is transferred to their animal. So then they will then say, well, my, my cat deserves to be outside when really um, that, that's no, not the case. Now, not <laughs> only are we on stolen land to begin with, but cats will, are, they're, they're efficient predators. Like we get, give them credit, right? I have a cat myself who's right here sitting next to me, um, Dexter C. Possum, who if I let him out, he'd be, he'd be able to take down birds and rodents easy. And he's never been an outdoor cat. Um, I walked through Tacoma just a few days ago and saw an outdoor cat easily taking Anna's hummingbird, right? And they're not easy to catch. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something to be said of, well, there, there are small things that we can do on the landscape that changes specifically how domestic animals use that landscape. And if you still are saying, well, my cat really does a lot better being outdoors. Okay, well, a compromise is you can create a catio. So this, this enclosed space outdoors for your cat to roam or you can walk your cat on a leash. There are many other opportunities. And you know, if a coyote eats your cat, then that's circle of life. <laughs> there you go. Michael, do you have any additional thoughts kind of considering Seattle's green spaces and your work there? Right. I also have a dog in my life. She's looking at me lucky <laughs> and she's really into running after squirrels and two and so i do we can't not have a gsp workshop without talking about off-leash dogs <laughs> and so it is one of these things that i don't think um the department or the state can really control it's like there's not enough like we don't want to be policing right the the park system so i think it is up to people to negotiate that or to work that out among themselves in the parks right we know there are laws in place um, but the other thing about this question, it does really speak to me about like fences, right? So like we're going back to the roots of conservation um, and how parks were built in our country and that like in, it goes back to like enclosure of the commons like in the 19th century, right? So or even it probably has history before that where fences go up, um, people in power, the oligarchs or whomever, like say, this is ours for us to, you know, we're gonna take this timber, we're gonna hunt here and you cannot. And if you do trespass, then you, you're gonna have some harm come to you either by um, uh, basically paying a fee or being, um, you know, have something taken away from you and sometimes your life. So I am really anti-fence. <laughs> it's like one of my pet peeves. And I do think it's like a way of dispossessing people of the common land and yeah, of, of property. And we all kind of seek that, like the keeping up with the Joneses, we're all trying to um, protect, you know, I think to a certain extent what's ours, but I think we need to think about kind of the common sources of oppression. 
Shan, I wanted to come to you next. Um, what are some of the Seattle Parks and Recreation's goals around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion? I feel like there's just some like very um, foundational information that I didn't share at the beginning, and and but really drives our work. So I wanted to provide an opportunity for you to kind of share share that background a little bit and kind of share where you think we're where we're at um, and what the next steps might look like. Absolutely. Um, so as highlighted in Lisa's opening and in much of Chris's presentation, park systems have long have a long history of being leveraged as tools for exclusion and oppression. Thus public servants and park advocates alike have an obligation, a duty to transforming ourselves, the way we do our work, the way we look at our work and our agencies into anti-racist multicultural organizations um, and really looking at our approach. In recognition of this fact, Seattle Parks and Recreation um, has committed to advancing representation, equitable outcomes, inclusion and belonging for communities who experience marginalization by transforming our programs, transforming our services, and most importantly, transforming our workplace culture and the way we do and the way we approach our work. Ways that we are focused include, uh, we're working to center the voices and experiences of uh, communities who experience marginalization. I can share with you all both our strategic plan that shows some ways that we are focused there. And um, also we have a uh, equity analysis filter that is uh, to be used with all decision-making. Um, that actually spells specifically out what our workforce and service equity determinants are and whose voices we're really centering uh, in decision making and in planning. Uh, we are also working to recognize and to dismantle manifestations of white supremacy cultural characteristics within our own workplace norms um, and within our own practices uh, through workforce development efforts. Uh, that includes training, that includes, like I said, uh, the leverage of those analysis tools that includes revamping um, our decision making procedures uh, and really looking at uh, how we are centering those voices, who makes decisions, who holds power, uh, who benefits and who holds the burden. Um, and uh, like, I was, like I cited those analysis and specifically policy reform in addition to that. Um, we're working to address the inequitable distribution of power and lack of accountability that exists within our own ranks. Um, like I was saying through um, combing through everything <laughs> as I was citing um, and really taking an honest and uh, real look um, at who we are and what we produce um, and having that centered, uh, having that look uh, really be led by uh, our community of staff who are closest to the issues and also uh, really being led uh, and the voices centered uh, the community members that we serve in order to do so. Uh, we are uh, we're actively working to center equity in our decision making and making as I cited um, also in our investments, which is a grand and difficult conversation, but we are powering through um, and our planning efforts. Uh, what we hope to bring about as a result uh, of this work are, as I stated, programs, services, policies, and funding strategies that create equitable outcomes. So your race, your gender, um, and our other social, our other uh, equity determinants will not dictate uh, your access will not dictate your outcomes, um, but we are, are really hoping to uh, produce more equitable ones. Uh, and we're looking at uh, strategies and actions that show measurable results. So as I cited before, taking a really hard long look at our systems for accountability, making those systems more transparent so that community, community can be with us on that journey as well um, and have the power and the information to hold us accountable, um, which hopefully will result in um, our, our support of healthy people, a healthy environment and strong communities, which are our, or, our ultimate organizational um, goals and outcomes and, and what we, we believe we exist for. And we will be coming uh, to you all in the new year and validating those beliefs um, <laughs> through the community engagement process because uh, we want to stay responsive. Uh, and that's a part of our resilience strategy is that we uh, stay in touch, we stay in relationship and we stay responsive. Mm -hmm. um, steps we're taking currently to get there. Um, we have, a, we're developing an SPR equity and engagement plan. Many of the activities that I was talking about before are a part of that um, in order to implement the city's goals and our goals um, in a way that centers equity. We uh, are developing an equity store scorecard and mapping tool that allows us to really look at and do some analysis on um, where our resources are currently allocated and how we will allocate either shift those resources or allocate future resources that are available to us um, and working to leverage the data that we have available and to set up new systems that uh, help us collect data that really highlights 
some of the disparities um, that may have been created that or are, are created through the way our current uh, policies, uh, services and programs are shaped. Um, we are revamping our, uh, what we call our ROSA plan, but it's essentially our like accountability plan to the mayor and to the Office of Civil Rights. Um, and trying to do that work a little more intentionally uh, in relationship with community and with staff who are experiencing marginalization. Uh, we have kicked off and are continuing to build a robust training program uh, and uh, developing an equity dashboard, which hopefully sometime in the future will be publicly available. Um, so that again, putting the information in the hands uh, of community uh, to be able to help us make those decisions and really help hold us accountable. In addition to that, our strategic plan, which um, as I stated before, hopefully we can share a link to you, has an explicit step uh, for each of the priorities for how we center equity. Um, so again, another tool, a tool for accountability. Yeah, definitely, it's an ongoing plan. So Michael, I wanted to tag you next and kind of ask if, if there was um, specifics within Green Seattle partnership programming um, that, that is looking at carrying out the diversity, equity, and inclusion work of the department. Sure, yeah, I think, um, I think where you most kind of concretely see where we're at is in embedded within the update to the Green Seal Partnership Strategic Plan that's out from 2017, where we have some explicit goals that we really never had before. Um, but, you know, some of the core playbook that we followed was from the Seattle's equity and the environment agenda. So we were, you know, for the past couple of years, we've been surveying ourselves and seeing, um, asking people to voluntarily identify um, in so they're de collecting demographics from events like volunteer events and seeing um, with whom we are working so kind of um, you can probably guess like we're mostly white <laughs> and I don't think I think there's some uh, kind of intricacies in like you know what that data is really telling us and you know how effectively we're collecting it but we are um, really making moves to you know accept everyone i think we have a long ways to go to really make like black and brown people really feel like they belong because traditionally like our volunteer forest steward base is really generally older and whiter um the other thing is with our service area so really we do have these equity um equity uh, focus areas and those really are it's city drive data that we overlay on our maps and we can see which parks um occur in these spots and the the indicators of those neighborhoods are essentially like um ex are expressed through some sort of marginalization right so it's based on ec socioeconomic status access to health care um, english as a second language so we have focused for a lot of work in those neighborhoods and um it's uh it's no joke either like uh crit Dr. Shell showed those redlined areas. So a lot of those equity focus areas are pretty much overlaid directly onto those, onto those older redlined, formerly redlined areas. Um, so we really, and we have this balance to play because we've had parks like Seward Park, you showed that Seward Park photo earlier on. Seward Park has been in the park system since like the early 1900s. And we have, it's like, we love it to death, but then we also have to balance like, you know, maintaining those parks, but then also dedicating service to other parts of the city. And, you know, so other forested ravines that for all intents and purposes look like, um, uh, we want clean water to flow through these ravines. We want air, um, you know, clean air as well. So we dedicate um, a significant amount of time every year from the, in our work planning to those areas. Um, so we had stipended youth engagements um, to, with like uh, specifically like a program our coworkers created since I started about 10 years ago was Youth Green Corps. So Shikandi Salisbury and Jacobo Jimenez have nurtured this Youth Green Corps program ever for almost a decade now um, and exposing people to black and primarily black and brown um, youth to uh, 
basically a future, uh, hopefully what I, we hope is a living wage future in, in kind of parks or in the green industries. Um, and really, I think the other thing I just talked about is what we're mostly proud of, and it's taken a while to build these relationships, is um, relationships with urban indigenous communities. So with um, Duwamish tribe, which is not a federally recognized tribe, and working with them because their backyard is essentially still the West Duwamish Greenbelt and their the ancestors live in the forest there. Also working with United Indians of all tribes out in Daybreak Star, which they're in year 50 of a hundred year lease. And um, really there hasn't been, um, there's a beautiful forest coming to, that's coming together there that will probably honor um, traditional harvesting and foraging there as a, as a key component in the restoration. Thank you both. Um, so I wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, another kind of key component of Green Seattle Partnership work. Um, so at the heart of our work, really, you know, we do a ton of invasive plant work um, and really attempting to influence forest health. I'm, I'm wondering, Chris, how that looks in your work, how you see the relationship between invasive plant cover and forest health kind of influencing wildlife populations in cities. Yeah, so I mean, I'll note that for many cities, Seattle included, the, that conversation of the relative proportion and distribution of native versus non-native plants is a really important one. And it's all taken with a grain of salt. So there are instances where certain, say for instance, bird species that are native to a region will choose to roost or nest in a plant species, tree species that is not native to a region, but serves the same functional purpose. So I think the conversation about biodiversity many folks will often think, okay, well, conserving native biodiversity. Here's the thing though, cities have fundamentally changed the way in which those ecosystems and ecoregions function that really you want, you want functional endemism, not necessarily mm -hmm. historic endemism. What that means is that you want plants that play the same functional role that allows for other species that depend on those plants to be able to thrive. So that means that yeah, we may not always have native species of vegetation that are in a region, but if they are approved and also serve the same type of functional purpose for other organisms, it's totally fine, right? Like trying to be super draconian and stick to ideals of yesteryear isn't going to get us anywhere. Like that's, <laughs> we're not, we're not going to be able to re-achieve uh, what the wilderness used to look like. All we now know is we can we can move forward into the future being like okay what are the mechanisms that help us to increase that biodiversity and oftentimes the vegetation if we were to talk about the you know top five list of things to do like that probably is number four honestly thinking about vehicle transport and domestic species are like a solid one or two and food mm -hmm. subsidies are close to three and sometimes they all vacillate Hmm. Interesting. Can you speak to nuisance coyotes? This is a question from, from the Q&A box. Can you speak to nuisance coyotes in urban areas and how best to coexist with them? Yeah, yeah. So if y'all remember from the talk at the beginning, I had said like human beings are the directors in the audience. We know that the top two reasons for nuisance coyotes actually becoming nuisance animals is number one, food subsidies. So don't feed the wildlife. I can't, I can't tell you how many times we say that and people still do it. Good example, right? If y'all been to Point Defiance Park, you know our raccoon population is notorious because you can park your car on the side of the road and you'll see one, then three, then five, and like 12 raccoons surround your car soliciting food. I was driving my boys, two and four year old, through the park, getting ready to go on a hike. And the car behind us, which there was a sign 50 yards away saying, don't feed the wildlife, we're feeding the, the raccoons french fries. <laughs> so no matter how many times I say, it, I feel like I'm gonna keep saying it, don't feed the wildlife. And we're doing more research now to see how not only are these animals, think about your you know, dog or your cat, right? If you give them a bunch of food, without any structure whatsoever, they're gonna take, I mean, 
parents, if you have kids, right? Like human children will do this. They'll take advantage of you as much as they possibly can. So like setting that structure in place is really important. We're also investigating the mecha- the physiological mechanisms that shape, say, the hormones and the microbiome and many other characteristics that shape how the animal then behaves to you. Good example. If you woke up this morning and you ate a bowl of Lucky Charms versus, say, eggs and sausage, which one would you be hungrier for in an hour? So say like you ate and then an hour later, you're likely going to be super hungry if you just ate a bowl of Lucky Charms versus, say, like high protein. That's what these animals in urban systems are doing. They're eating more food subsidies that are protein poor, which says a lot about our diet. And then that is likely, we hypothesize, influencing their behavior. So I cannot stress enough. Number one, don't feed wildlife. Number two is thinking about the relationship that we create with domestic animals and um, these wild animals and cats and dogs. Those two together are the number two on the list in terms of nuisance animals. So all of the animals that you normally hear on the news about, oh, they bit my child or they were really aggressive to me. It's because they were being fed or there are domestic animals in the region that indirectly there's food that's left out for those domestic animals that then the coyotes pick up or there's a lot of conflict between the two. Um, I'll say just as a daily PSA, if you see a coyote in your neighborhood, say you're walking through Seward Park, right? Um, Don't just awe and fawn over the fact that the coyote is there if it sits and it watches you. Like if it gets closer to you, you want to raise yourself up as big as you possibly can. Clap your hands. If you have pot and pans, which I don't think you would if you're walking in the park, but if you did, bang them, right? Like jangle your keys, walk towards them. Get them to run away from you because um, what happens as a coyote is that they are testing the waters every single time they they, um, look at you. We used to have this running joke when I was doing my dissertation work at this captive coyote facility in Millville, Utah, that for those of you that are Nintendo fans, you'll get this reference. You'll know how like if you're Mario, you're in one of the ghost castles and you're walking and the big ghost, if you turn your back, like starts chasing you. But then if you turn around and you look at the ghost, it stops and it covers its eyes. Coyotes, they do the same thing everywhere. Every coyote I've ever seen does the same thing everywhere. Where if you turn your back, They'll try and get as close as they possibly can to test the waters. But then if you look at them, they'll be like, oh, I've been seen. And then they'll stop or they'll run away. Just be persistent. Walk towards them. They look like they, they're big. They're not that big. Like on average, they're 20 to 30 pounds. They're just really fluffy. So they make themselves look big. So PSA, make yourself look big. Make a lot of noise. I see all the coyotes as my babies. So oftentimes be like, come on, y'all. You know, you're not supposed to be doing this. Like go, go back into the green space. Come on, y'all. So yeah, da- daily PSA, just scare the animals. We call it hazing. It's not bad. It actually keeps them alive. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. We actually do have a, a coyote in Seward Park right now that's not acting good. You got to come up and talk to it because it is uh, it's harassing dogs, which is unusual in a lot of our green spaces, I would say. Uh, it's yeah. a particularly aggressive coyote. Um, yeah. And so this gets us to a really important question, critical in the, the question and answer um, here. What did the coyote want in the Quiznos? <laughs> to be left alone and to have the space to itself. <laughs> to pretty much just say like, no, I own this territory. You can get the hell out of here. Um, that animal's like, I, I don't know if they put a collar on it after it was relocated, but that animal's home range was part of downtown. So like in downtown Chicago, there are these green spaces where the animals will kind of have refuge, have their den sites at, and then at night, they'll oftentimes venture into the city. Here's the other good thing about coyotes, right? I will, I will say that there are folks that don't like coyotes, and I use the line from The Dark Knight of, they may not be the heroes that we want, but they're the heroes that we need because they're the they're the only apex predator that's able to survive and tolerate people. So they'll go through at night and eat the brown rats and the other rodents and the rabbits, which have exploded in Seattle, right? They'll take them out. That's free pest management for us. So um, yeah, I'll say that Quizzo's coyote was pretty much just saying like, no, this is this is clearly part of my territory. It's in my home range. Why would I not stroll into this Quiznos? <laughs> but with that side eye it was like leave me alone right um, yeah 
I uh, I think it's interesting as well because in Seward Park, I think we have um, a species of uh, rodent called mountain beaver, which most people aren't familiar with. They're like, what a beaver in mountains? Um, but it is it's a upland species that uh, does a pretty amazing job um, taking down seedlings, and so um, really influences regeneration in the forest. Uh, and there was a while there where we didn't have coyote, um, a coyote den in the park. And I think that uh, same kind of population dynamics as with um, bunnies, uh, more mountain beaver can be problematic to our other goals around um, urban canopy. So we got to have it all. Um, I have a question here uh, that I think is really interesting and, and, and it's not going to be an easy one, but I'm going to throw it out there. How does Seattle limit access to decision making? for natural areas uh, of friends groups who may be more white and privileged than the surrounding community. Sean Yannick or Michael, you wanna take it on? He muted. Maybe, let <laughs> me see. I, I might have to hear the question again. How does... Um, Sorry, it just jumped away from me. Too. Yeah, I can I can imagine it's harder to. Oh, I'm sorry. There's so many it jumped away. Where did it go? Hey, Lisa, it's in the if you look up at the top where it says the answered tab, oh, okay. uh, you'll see it as the third one down there. Thank you. Um, how does Seattle limit access to decision making for natural areas? Um, decision making of friends friends of groups um, mm. who may be more white and privileged than the surrounding community. Right, limit access to friends groups. So there's friends groups. So traditionally, if you look at our original, thanks, Toby, good question. Originally from this question from, um, uh, you look in our original 20 year plan, um, you'll definitely see a whole slew of friends groups that were originally noted as partners, right? And um, some of those groups have either, some of them are still with us, some of them are, are not. Um, we, you know, it's one of these things, it's a, it's a balance between, you know, we, balance, we still have these relationships. You know, we in GSP started just 15 years ago and we inherited um, volunteer groups from the early days, like the late nineties and some of the early restoration goes back to those late nineties. So, you know, it's a, it's a combination of maintaining, you know, those relationships while also, um, you know, as we, as we start to do work in these new, we call new parks where we really traditionally haven't been before, um, you know, it is a process of engaging the neighbor. It's just like walking around on the street, meeting neighbors and like, you know, giving them my card, emailing them and telling us what, telling them what the program is all about. So um, I think, uh, you know, just with like our volunteer um, base, you know, we really want um, the volunteer base to mirror the, the changing and current, the current and changing demographics of the city of Seattle. So it's, um, I don't know if I'm really answering the question, but um, we're getting to the heart of what he, what they're asking, but there is, um, it's a current, I think it's always as the program grows, because we grow in size of acres, and then we, you know, we're working in different neighborhoods across the city. It's always, it's just a matter of like getting out and talking, meeting with the neighbors, I think what I heard in this question was, um, how are we lifting the voice of previously silenced or previously unheard community members? We might have uh, communities of folks, oh, I might have frozen. Uh oh, freeze. We might have communities of folks whose voices are commonly lifted and commonly heard and already um, are really adept at getting access to our decision making process but what efforts are we engaged in in order to ensure that we are centering and lifting the voices of folks who um, have not traditionally been able to uh, access our decision-making processes through the kind of common ways we do so. Uh, for, I mean, I think it's really about where you put your energy and where you um, invest your time. And so uh, one of the things that I feel like we're doing as an agency is uh, investing more energy and more time and more effort into um, not to use a 
a cliche term, but meeting people where they are. We are not limiting ourselves to public meetings. Um, we're not limiting ourselves to gathering folks uh, in the ways we traditionally have. Um, we cannot, in our current uh, virtual state, uh, rely on many of those uh, old bastions in the first place. Um, and so we are spending more time and more energy and more effort um, building relationship with folks who do not have access to our old um, our old ways of connecting um, and uh, devising new ways to connect, essentially. Mm -hmm. I think, um, Michael gave some examples of how uh, our GSP, our unit that um, supports GSP specifically is doing those things. Um, and if you are interested in uh, how the department is moving forward with those efforts, like I said, we're gonna launch pretty soon here, a new community engagement uh, effort. Um, and so many of those things will be eliminated. And I'll say, keep an eye on the CL Parks and Recreation webpage for more of those opportunities. For sure. I wanted to end on, on one question here um, that I think is uh, has a little more hopeful tone. Um, Chris, what do you think the opportunities um, are uh, if we were to be able to move forward a Green New Deal to address both fragmentation of urban ecological systems and environmental and so social justice? Yeah, I mean, I think there are plenty, plenty of opportunities mm -hmm. and uh, they, they exist in a lot of places. It, it really just takes, and this kind of dovetails from, from the previous question of, you know, how do we kind of de- construct the way in which we're doing stuff, decolonize, if you will. Um, it, it means just like, if you have power, right? Relinquish that power a little bit. I mean, I think we all kind of are, are cool with that. Now for me, I, I, I take this um, very seriously with my students in kind of undergrad or graduate is like, I got to this point. So then that way I can make it easier for you. And I imagine that for us that are, we're in positions of power, we could do quite literally the same. So for community organizers that have been on the streets grassroots movements that have been doing the work, just saying like, okay, cool, awesome. What can I do to help facilitate some of the work that you think would be impactful in your communities? And here are the resources that I have accordingly. Um, it, it, I think if we start at the grassroots, which has been done before and from lessons from our ancestors in the civil rights movement, they kind of gave us the yellow brick road, honestly, of like, how do you organize accordingly? What does that mean for resting power in communities that have the, the on the grounds knowledge, then putting them in positions of power and not just positions of power that have a title, but no influence, have the title and the influence in that power and allow them to do so in whatever means that, that means for the currency of the job. So if the currency of the job means actual currency, pay them, give money to the organizations that are doing the work. For us, the currency is say publications, right? You'll hear the term publish or perish. That means I oftentimes will amplify the voices of my students to have them be the leaders on the writing phase and what that means in me being a good mentor. Um, we use the acronym JEDI, so Justice, Equity, Diversity, Diversity and Inclusion, quite a bit of late in academic circles. And I like to think of like, being, what does it mean to be a JEDI mentor and to train other JEDI warriors, right? Like very, very much pop culture centered, but it allows for folks to rethink who belongs in the sciences and at the, at the center of all of this is if you think about this leaky pipeline idea, the idea that there are so many folks that look like us that are not um, part of the white male heteronormative that we traditionally see in the sciences that will eventually become the people that need to be hired on for these jobs, right? We have to address education at the K through 12 level and how certain teachers may have biases to tell their students that they don't really do well in science, maybe they should do something else, or like you get to the undergrad level. And I'm saying all this from personal experience. Like when I was an undergrad in the sciences, there were five other black people as an undergrad in my program in psychology and environmental science. When I got to grad school, there were two black people, myself included, and my other good friend and colleague was almost didn't finish because of the, the amount of microaggressions she got. When I did my postdoc, I was the only black person in the building. UW Tacoma, I'm the only black faculty member. Like it shouldn't be like that. And yet that, that leaky pipeline persists. So we, we can fix it. We definitely can fix it, but it, it takes each individual and a community of organizers to like rethink what, what do we consider something that is an environmental good? And then everything else will flow from that. 
Awesome. I'm going to pause and um, share my last um, slide here uh, so that I can make some connections um, with uh, folks for the Green Seattle Partnership. Um, I think that there are a lot of opportunities. Mm, sorry, not working so well. Pause. Oh boy. Well, we can do it probably without a slide. Um, I think I have our Instagram handle memorized. Um, but I wanted to point people to the Green Seattle Partnership website and to be able to connect with us on social media, either Instagram, Facebook, um, Twitter. Uh, and um, in the new year, really look for opportunities to provide um, provide your voice and, and um, contribute to the Green Seattle Partnership. We do have paid uh, positions for youth. We do have job training programs that offer that opportunity to um, build skill and, um, and find your way in the green job pipeline. And so I would encourage folks to, to join us and learn more about our work at uh, www.greenseattle.org. Or of course, you can just search Green Seattle Partnership. Um, and yeah, thank you all for your time. Um, and we look forward to talking with you more. Thanks Actually, everyone. as before we, yeah, thank you. Before we head out, I did want to also mention that as you leave um, the meeting, you'll you'll get a um, pop up uh, that will have just a really brief survey. We'd love to hear from from you there as well. Thank you guys for your time today, and thank you so much, um, Chris, Shanyanika, Michael. Um, it was a pleasure to have this conversation today. Take care, everybody. Good stuff. Thanks.